Hello, thank you for joining us today, everyone. The GCLS Virtual Series Committee welcomes you to the virtual panel From Love to Hate, Enemies to Lovers Romances. An illustrious panel of authors will talk about the enemies to lovers trope. How do they take their characters from butting heads to knocking boots? And finally, to a believable happily ever after. Now, this panel is sponsored by Flashpoint Publications. Flashpoint Publications is now accepting submissions from all authors with any novel length stories within the rainbow spectrum. Please be sure to visit them for more information at flashpointpublications.com slash submissions. Again, thank you so very much to Flashpoint Publications for sponsoring this panel today. Now, to make this session as interactive as possible, please use the Q&A box during the entire session. Feel free to start asking questions now if you'd like. You're also welcome to chat with each other, but remember to change that to to everyone. And also please remember the GCLS Code of Conduct, which you can read more about in the chat and on the GCLS website. So let's get started. We hope that you enjoy the event. And now I'd like to hand off the session to our moderator, Carson Tate. Hello, I would like to ask all my panelists to join me, please. My name is Carson Tate and I'm excited to host this um, panel where we will maybe behave and talk about, um, maybe not, talk about enemies to lovers. <laughs> I'm so excited about this group. Um, so I want to start out by introducing everyone. So I'm going to, we have two Fionas, so this, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so, um, I could come up with nicknames, but I'm not going to. Um, so I'm going to start with Brenda Murphy. So skip Fiona's altogether. <laughs> um, Brenda Murphy is an award-winning multi-published author with Nine Star Press. Her novel Double Six received the 2020 Goldie for Erotica. And the first book in her new small town romance series, On the Square, was a 2021 Goldie finalist. She loves sideshows and tattoos. And yes, those are her monkeys. Where are your monkeys? Is that your, where's your monkey? I left both monkeys at home. Well, see, you know, <laughs> you can't tease a monkey and not bring it into the show with us. <laughs> you have about two minutes to find a monkey. Um, moving on. <laughs> Fiona Zed, um, Jamaican born author of several novels, including the Lambda Literary Award finalists, Bliss and Every Dark Desire. She loves French pastries, so do I, English cars, so do I, and Jamaican food, yes, and currently lives in Spain. I do not live in Spain, so that is the only thing we don't have in common. Her novel, Dangerous Pleasures, received a Publishers Weekly starred review and was the winner of an About.com Reader's Choice Award for Best Level lesbian novel memoir her novel stud like her love that title is available now find out more at fionazed.com and i encourage you to post your websites in the chat authors while i'm blathering on um and next we we're going to break up the fionas and go to rachel lacy <laughs> rachel is an award-winning contemporary romance author and a semi semi reformed travel junkie i'm thinking you just got stuck not traveling because of covid right <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> She's, uh, see, now this is a theme, I guess. <laughs> She's been climbed by a monkey <laughs> on, on a mountain in Japan, mm -hmm. gone scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef, and camped out overnight in New York City for a chance to be an extra in a movie. We'll ask more about that later. These days, the majority of her adventures take place on the pages of the book she writes. She lives in warm and sunny North Carolina with her family and a variety of rescue pets. What's the temperature there today? It is in the 50s here today. Okay. So, yeah. Mild. Mild. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Fiona Riley. Fiona writes contemporary lesbian romance with a high heat quotient for both strokes books. Once deemed the queen of steam by a reader, she proudly reps the title by writing the steamiest sex scenes around, especially those between enemies to lovers. And I saved you for last because that's the best segue to our panel today. <laughs> 
You're and we're just going to launch right in. <laughs> Audience, I encourage you to ask questions and, um, dude, seriously, I'm sorry. <laughs> Say hi to Cartman. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's the obligatory pet photo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so audience, um, if you have a specific question for the panel, please put it in the Q and a box. Um, feel free to shout out to amongst yourselves and to us via the chat roll. And we're just going to launch right in. And my first question is this describe what you think are the essential elements. If there are any of the enemies to lovers trope, um, it could be long brewing conflict leading to a slow burn romance, loathe at first sight, uh, and then discuss why you've chosen to write this particular trope. And I'm going to start with Rachel Lacey. Oh, okay. Um, for me, I think there's two essential elements. And the first one is that tension, that spark that's going to turn, I hate you into, I want to kiss you. We got to have that. And the other one is a little bit more vague for me, but we need something, and it may be something that the reader knows that the characters don't know yet, but something that shows us that these two people are meant to be together. They don't know it yet, but we've seen something, whether it's in their regular day-to-day -day lives or whatever, that lets us have that knowledge. That's great. So it could even be like, uh, you see something missing in their day-to-day -day life. In yeah. Other words, it would yeah. be the perfect fit, but they just don't know it yet. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Fiona Z, I'm going to go with, <laughs> so, so we're going to do this. <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> Care to chime in? <laughs> sure. Um, my answer is not as fun. I think for me, like the essential part of an enemies to lovers romance is, is passion. Um, whether it's a passion to hate each other, a passion to direct, directly want to like jump into bed or whatever surface they have to have that right away and so once that happens it can go anywhere i mean um slow burn lust at first sight doesn't matter like the passion is there it's going to happen it's going to be great mm -hmm. so what's attractive to you about this particular trope i love that it's not a static even if you're if you don't write in like intensely dramatic books you with an with an enemy to lover story, you can't write a static story because they they see each other, they hate each other, they, it just goes up and down. It, it has automatic movement, and that for me, I need that. I can see I need like that sort of like guide as I write my story. And an enemy to lovers has that automatic kick to it. Like you know, you're gonna have something juicy and something that flows and and moves. That makes a lot of sense. Fiona R. <laughs> um, so for me, it's, it's, I like antagonism. I like to be teased. I want them to, to antagonize each other to the point that they're borderline inappropriate. Like one of them's going <laughs> to lose their temper. One of them's going to say something they don't mean. One of them's going to throw co coffee at somebody else. Um, you know, my most recent book that had was an enemies to lovers was uh, beginner's bet. And that was, uh, I'm sorry, it was bet against me. And that, um, was a story about rival realtors. And for it to work, they had to be competing against each other to make, to get this end goal. And whoever won this bet at the end um, was going to be, you know, the supreme winner of the whole thing. So it started as a, a business transaction and an a immediate rivalry over an award that one of them received, the other one thought they were more worthy of. So for me, it's a matter of antagonism. I want them to be catty and I want them to be smart and I want them to be in each other's face as much as possible before that crosses that line. I think that builds that tension for the future, you know, to get through whatever they need to get through to stoke whatever slow burn is going to happen. So it's an inferno for sure. So for me, it's that I need them to be antagonistic. However, that happens. So high stakes for you. Absolutely. That was, you know, an invitation. <laughs> isn't, isn't your series called the high? Stakes? It's called the high stakes romance series. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice You're up. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda, talk to us of monkeys and enemies to lovers. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I, I think I think what everybody's saying right there has to be that tension. Um, the folk, most of my books kind of, I love that. Oh my God, I slept with you. And now it was supposed to just be fun or maybe not. Maybe I'm angry because I stepped over a line. I didn't mean to, 
And we have to sort out what that is. Um, and for me, it's that exploring that power dynamic, especially if there's, um, you know, when you come into two people who are equally as hard headed um, and equally as passionate about what they're doing and how they're going to sort that out, who's driving this train? You know, and I write BDSM romance, and most of my enemies to lovers are set in that situation. So a lot of times you really get to parse apart that, okay, if we're going to, if we are both coming at this from a top position or a mistress position, how is that going to work out? And so I love to play with that. I love that's, that's what for me, and it has to be believable. It has to be high stakes. It has to be something that you believe in their passion. You believe in also their agitation with each other. But a lot of times that agitation, just because they're, they're attracted to you and they shouldn't be, or they don't think they should be. So, so that for me is really that, that peeling those layers um, and making people realize, I mean, I, I love it when they just are, you know, the, the classic is that line, right? You know, I love you. And the other person says, I know, right? And it's kind of like, okay, now I'm really going to kick your ass. And so for me, that's kind of what, that's where I go with it. And that's what I love about Enemy to Lovers Romance. So they, they have that friction that crosses over. So, so if it's, it, I, I'm curious, if it's in the BDSM setting, is it, is the enemies to lovers just part of the scene or is it real enemies to lovers and then maybe playing on a scene that's different? So how does that change things if, if at all? In most of mine, it's, it's real to begin with. And in, in double six, um, I want to hold it up, which I hope it's not backwards, but anyway, um, they're rival mistresses. You know, the one is applying for, oh. for a job and, and they're a rival because uh, Elaine is the queen and there can only be one queen. And so, the person who's coming in, Petra's like, I don't think so. So there's that dynamic and that is not necessarily part of it. In fact, Elaine is a little mortified that Petra wants to see with her because she's like, I don't, where are we going with this? And so yeah. she's kind of put off, off a step. So, um, so yeah, so it's outside of their normal dynamic, I guess is the, is because it's not a, it's not a, I haven't written an enemies to lover where it's a sub mistress dynamic. It's usually two mistresses trying to sort out that. Very interesting. So keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> she's making notes. There's going to be a test later. There's going to be a pop quiz. <laughs> so yeah, uh, several of you kind of hinted at this, but one of the things I really enjoy about the enemies to lovers trope is the tension that underlies the main character's interaction. But there is a delicate balance um, between sparring and all out battle. Um, and you know, you don't want, you want people to like both your main characters because you, you know, you're ultimately going to put them together. So I hope <laughs> so you want them to root for that couple. So how do you get them to keep from choosing sides and like hating one and not hating the other? I mean, how do you, how do you make your characters likable women we want to root for while having them win? <laughs> <laughs> and so let's jump to Fiona Z for this one. I knew you were going to do that. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always the one in the class that says, no, not me, not me. I um, can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, what I like to do is um, introduce in subtle, not subtle ways, the vulnerabilities of both characters. So you know they're both acting aggressive and just you know angry and walled off and icy but then to show i show their vulnerability so that the reader knows that this is where they're coming from they're not just being mean because they're awful they're mean because they have these these wounds that need to be sorted and so both of them have the, the wounds that are coming together to beat at each other and then slowly you see them trying to heal each other and heal themselves and also end up in bed together. I think the hand. This the is hand the international hand. symbol for end up in bed together. <laughs> that that we were done. Now. Panel, panel over. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. I, I mean, this is not truly analogous, but like I used to watch Criminal Minds all the time, and and then they'd always make the like killer have some horrible thing that had happened to them in their past, and you're like, ah. I see exactly. why you killed all those people, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
Get a rock panel, Carson. <laughs> Rhyme on the brain, but, but it's the same kind of thing. You know, you, you'll root for somebody when you find out the why, when you can peel back right. those layers. I, I think that's a really good point. <laughs> Sorry for my lapse into serial killing. Um, <laughs> Rachel, your turn. <laughs> um, I think to build on what Fiona said, it, it is to get you, um, to get the reader to identify with both of the characters. We need to see like what's motivating them. And like she said, you know, what their wounds are. And, um, and I also like to show the characters in their better moments as well. Like we need to really see them like in their day-to-day lives with their friends and families. Maybe they're interacting with a pet, whatever it is. We need to see them when they're at their best and not just when they're at each other's throats. And that helps the reader really become um, invested in both characters. And I think that's, that's the core of what we're talking about is you have to get the reader equally invested in both of them so that they're not picking sides. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah. Brenda. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the question. I, I did too. I just just kidding. Kidding. I'm just no. kidding. How do, you, how do you keep from having the reader like choose sides? Like this one's less of a jerk than this one. Right. So I'm going to like this person. How do you make them both likable and root for the couple? Well, and I think everybody's hit on it. It's like, you have to show them at their best. You have to show their vulnerabilities. You have to give a believable reason why they are the way they are. Like if you don't, I'm a real fan of the lie that people tell themselves and the lie that they tell other people and, um, and working that in, like, I'm fine that all these terrible things happened to me as a kid. And I've put that or as a young person or whatever, and I have put that aside and now I'm just fine. There's nothing wrong with me and I'm okay. Fine. I'm just fine. And, um, and they're not, and again, they have wounds, but, but getting to work that into the story and then showing them, you know, being nice to their grandma, they can be the worst person in the world, but you know, they're nice to their grandma, they're nice to their kid, or maybe, or they're, maybe they're fierce because they have a grandma to take care of and they have a kid to take care of. I mean, you know, working those things in and making them an, an empathetic character. I'm like, I'm a big fan of empathetic characters versus sympathetic characters, because I think you can just get so maudlin with that, that it damps everything down. But an empathetic character is like you said, oh, I can understand why you offed all those people in this way. I can understand why you don't let anybody get close. You know, why you just, you know, it's a hit and run, why you have a hit and run lifestyle as opposed to settling down Another with one death person. Reference. Huh? <laughs> Another death reference hit and run. Death <laughs> reference. It's a dark panel. <laughs> we might be violating dark a code of conduct. Stuff. I don't know. I write dark stuff. I will totally cop to that. I write dark stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no g- great answer fiona round us out on this one fiona riley <laughs> that's me um so you know i so my book uh bet against me got, i got a lot of feedback about this book because people were either team trina or team kendall uh and those people are hard and fast they've never switched sides you know they agreed with one person from the beginning you know in this particular um book because they were rival it's a it's a high stakes real estate market but so behind because they were rivals and they're both incredibly successful on their own they came through things with this this over exuberant confidence that was borderline narcissistic both of them because they're very successful and they've never run into anyone who's been an equal rival before so you know i did have that scene where one of them you know calls the other a bitch and you know there's border there's someone's gonna lunge and someone's gonna get hit and then they get separated and you know for me um because they are individual, you know, I'll use Brenda's references, queens of their, you know, what they do. Uh, For me, that's where all of it came from. They they came from that. So I think that other Fiona is correct in saying that you need to show all the things they do on their personal time. And I agree with Rachel and see that they are humans, but they both are defending this title that they desperately want. And so it just shows their motivations and shows their passion. I think that that really translates to further later on, but I, I have readers that have never taken a side. They agree that it's really, they're really team Kendall or team Trina. Um, I have my own team, but honestly, that's, I won't, I won't disagree with your choices, but yeah, people immediately sided. And even though I think that they both have their moments of vulnerability and, you know, explanation of their actions there, I, there's people who's hard and fast and never changed their mind on that. I, I think that there's a natural inclination to do that. Even in a non enemies to lovers romance, you just kind of align or find an affinity with one of the characters. Um, 
that you can relate to, you know? So, so which t-shirt are you wearing? Team Kendall, team Trina? You know, <laughs> it's, it's the start of a merch opportunity. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the start of a three book series. It was the start of a three book series. And for me, Trina, Trina Lee is the start of this entire three book series. She's the cornerstone of this real estate office. So I'm team Trina all the way through. And most people are not, I love Kendall, but Trina's my girl. So, but she's also a little nasty and she's really antagonistic and like, you know, bringing ice cold coffee to this woman and calling her an ice queen and like, just really antagonizing, getting up under her skin and just walking the line enough to get away with it. Um, yeah, I'm team Trina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to comment on what that says, but <laughs> so we have some audience questions. So let's pivot to those um, real quick. We've got people doing shout outs in the chat roll to y'all. <laughs> All right. So here's, here's a good one. Is it essential that side characters help cultivate the enemy situation? So I'm going to just kind of expand on that. Like how do you come up with the conflict and does it have to be, I mean, like, like, you know, just how do you come up with a conflict for these, for the enemies to lovers romance? I mean, do you start with that? Do you start with characters who should just be at war? Is it just manufactured? You know, just expound upon that, Rachel. <laughs> um, whether side characters, I think for me, side characters i mean they're key to building the story but not necessarily to the enemy's part i feel like that's usually more of a situational thing like they're competing for the same goal and same something or some you know someone has done something in their life that ruins something in the other character's life um so i don't i don't feel like the side characters are essential to that but i think that they're definitely essential to the book and to fleshing out you know letting both of our protagonists have someone to to vent to and, 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 uh, carry the plot that way. And, and kind of what you said earlier about, they, they show the humanity of the mm -hmm. characters. Yeah. They can help do that as well. Fiona Z. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's me. Yes. Basically. So, um, my side characters just sort of pop up and do whatever they want to do. Um, they, I don't, have it where they're supporting the enemy situation or they're trying to to make peace they're just carrying on with their own lives and they help to make the romance happen but only incidentally but they just pop up and they're there to make them seem just multifaceted and i, I try not to have them like feed the anger of one character or the other they're just there to sort of like fill in the landscape and hopefully make it a more rounded three-dimensional story that makes a lot of sense and kind of dovetails on what Rachel was saying. Fiona R. Uh, so because this was the start of a three book series, the best friend in this book is the, the lead in the second book. Um, so she actually plays a little interference. She helps to get the main character, Trina, on track and be like, you know, listen, you're pushing things a little too far. But then also when they do get together and break up, she's the she's the bodyguard. She steps in between. She stops the girlfriend from coming back into the life when things aren't working and, and the relationships aren't right. So um, this book, because it is the start of a, oh, it's a world building series, they do play a very important role but more of an emotional role for like monitoring you know how the main character feels how trina feels how things like that kendall doesn't have any friends she comes into this basically without anyone except for her spin class teacher oh. um so her her you know her approach is a little different whereas trina has friends and and you know her whole relationship is this business and they also are in the same business so they they help her be successful in winning the bet that starts the book but they also you know play interference if they need to and and, and she does her do friends do step in to protect her when things go south that's great. I like I like the role of friends. I, I think it's super important and it's fun to read in a book, especially when you get to see the friend be the lead in another book as well. Brenda, round us out. Yeah, um, I'd like to actually sound like a plot more than I do, but I don't. Um, Just, so we won't so know. Side Just... characters really, for me, oftentimes go completely off script and, and I don't know exactly what they're gonna do until we get in the situation. Um, in most of my books, side characters often are mirrors for the, the character that, that needs 
the most input and um, all of uh, double six is, is a single point of view. So um, in double six, you know, Elaine, Elaine really doesn't have any friends and she's like the ice queen of all. I mean, people scurry from Elaine. That's how bad she is. They, they just get her out of the way. Um, and, but except for one who was a lead character in the previous book, like in book four. Um, and she just really is probably the only person besides Elaine's sister who is not afraid of her and just calls her on her stuff. And I think that that's a really valuable role for a secondary character is that, you know, somebody has to say, what the hell are you doing? You know, can, can you get a grip here? Do you, you know, back up and take a look at what you're doing because you're not making any sense. And especially when they do like those over the top dramatic things that I love um, in an enemy still ever, but you're like, do they really do that? Okay. All right. But you know, what are you thinking? So that's my, my secondary character roles and they, kind of pop up and do their own thing. So that's where I'm at. I, I think, um, I think that's even more important sometimes in a book where you don't have both characters point of view and both of the main characters point of view sometimes. So uh, that makes that, that touches on another point about perspective and, and how you're telling the story. So thank you for that. So another question we have here is, um, and I, I'm going to kind of add to it. Is the romance a slow burn? If not, how do you handle? So, so what do you think a type of, of romance is better suited to enemies to lovers trope, like slow burn? I'm going to say Fiona Z is going to say no. (laughs) (laughs) I'm correct. I'm not going to say no. And so if not, what, what (laughs) type of, of fiery story slow or, super fire, super fire, <laughs> where they're like this. I don't know. <laughs> right at the first page. Um, <laughs> third page. Right, take it, Fiona Z. <laughs> Answer any question you want. Go ahead. Yeah, just basically, basically like, hmm, I don't know. Um, <laughs> or or do I you am- even think there is a particular type or can you make anything work as enemies to lovers? I really think that, you know, it's, I'm almost with, with Brenda in terms of, I don't really plot and it's sometimes it slows me down. And so when I jump into the story, I come at it from either a line, a line of dialogue or an interesting character, or even just, you know, a, a scene. And so I, I go with it. I f- flow with it. And so if enemy to lovers pops out of that, fantastic. If, it, if it's another trope, that's great. And so it's, um, I tend to tap to tag the labels or the, the tropes on at the end of the story. So I rarely go in trope first. <laughs> I love that. Trope first or nope first. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, how about you? Um, I think it can work in a lot of different ways. It's definitely suited to a slow burn because it sees them through the the enemies part and you just get that increasingly like escalating tension and heat between them but it's also really fun when it's something like you know maybe they've like met and had a one night stand or something and then they get thrust into what other situation makes them enemies that's a really fun option too so i think it would be hard to have them with an ongoing relationship throughout the book while they're also enemies so probably probably one of those two is Seems like it makes sense, but I, you know, romance authors, we can make anything work. So, <laughs> romance authors, we go all ways. Um, <laughs> that's your t shirt. We're, we're flexible. <laughs> Fiona Riley. Um, you know, you have something to say? I have many things to say all the time. Um, <laughs> this particular story was a slow burn. And I think the reason it needed to be a slow burn is I really need them to come across as, as being loathsome to each other immediately. I will say that the second, um, they meet at an award ceremony for best realtor of the year. So the night that they meet, actually Kendall is a hundred percent Trina's type. And she says that the minute she sees her, she's like, oh, wow. You know, normally I'd be really attracted to you and pursue you, except you're a bitch. But I mean, like that was <laughs> like that's how it starts so like you know that there's a physical attraction at least from trina immediately um and then it comes through that kendall like sneaks a photograph of her when they're in a place together and she's sort of looking at it later so you know there's a physical attraction but i needed them to be 
real enemies when this book started. So for me, it had to be a slow burn because I needed to be realistic. This is a pretty significant bet. They need to get through. Um, it's a lot of money. They're going to end up with a lot of money at the end of this. So um, career making money. So this really had to work. So for me, it was a slow burn. I think a slow burn where there's a lot of tension in the beginning where people don't like each other just makes it that much better mm -hmm. because like you're already all amped up because they're fighting constantly. You don't know what one's going to say to the other. They're always borderline too rude. And then eventually they're like, well, you know, I kind of also am flirting with you and I don't like you. And then it sort of trickles over. So for me, that slow burn was hundred percent worth what this had to be. It had to be a slow burn for it to work. Mm -hmm. Super slow. Slow and hot. <laughs> slow and low. Okay, Brenda. <laughs> I couldn't write a slow burn, I think, if I was paid a lot of money to. Um, it's just Let's not. Let's talk about I'm, money then. <laughs> right. It's just not how my brain works. Um, and yeah, so that was the thing in double six. They continue to have these interactions because she's applying for a job in a brothel. And part of that is auditioning. And part of those auditionings are intimate moments wherein the queen gets to observe your interaction with another staff member. So that's just, you know, so then you get to play with that wanting to be involved more than just observing in the scene. So there's a lot of tension there, but I think that, I think it'll, I think it works for slow burns. I mean, I read slow burns. That's not a, that's not a problem. Um, but I think that just for me, I, I don't, I, my brain doesn't work that way. Um, and probably because it takes a fair amount of plotting. So I work much better if things just bang along. <laughs> it's like we're just bang along, out, right? Bang, bang along. along. <laughs> just bang a ring and go. <laughs> That's right. You know, I can sort that out. I, I can sort that out as we go along and, and figure that out. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter if I have a, a huge plot board with a lot of strings and lines and things like that. But um, it also it, You're it like, also screw feels, that we're banging right. Well, it also it lets me you know it feels much more organic to me. I mean, as far as those situations where you're like, oh my god, I can't believe we're in bed together again. What the hell was I thinking? And my characters tend to do that a lot. <laughs> Post-its out the window. Well, what I got out of all that was something about banging, and I need to go interview at a brothel because it sounds like a fun job. If you're queen. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay, this is a good question. None, none of these, these are great audience questions. Thank you for, for all of you who have spent time asking these. So when you create tension with passionate inappropriate, nasty interactions. We're looking at you, Fiona Riley. What lines are you personally unwilling to cross as an author? And I'm not going to go to you first. I'm going to go to Rachel first on this one. Good choice. <laughs> uh, personal lines are not willing to cross. I think like, anything that would be like unforgivable in the, unforgivable between the two of them, but also from the reader. And I'm kind of drawn a blank on what that would be off the top of my head but just like I think they need to treat each other with respect even if they're extremely antagonistic and like Fiona said calling each other a bitch or whatever but like you know they're in this really competitive place and that they're not being you know just just disrespectful and nasty for the sake of it so I think I think that's that's drawing the line is they can hate each other and they can be rude but they they still need to be like you know respectful when it, when the, when it's all said and done. So I'm going to go to you next, Brenda, because your book is set in a, in a area where crossing lines can be wanted or, you know, there's the boundary things going on here. There are very, um, at least in my BDSM rule world, there are rules and, um, there are lines you, you know, non, non consensual things are the line. And, and that's my hard and fast line for any book that I write. Non-con is just not okay. And that's, and I always make sure that that element is always part. And so that's probably, if there was any line that I, I won't cross this, I, I don't cross the non-consent line. Other than that, it's pretty much fair game because you're in a BDSM setting. So, and what would be, you know, somebody else slapping your face in any other setting would probably be over the line for a lot of books, but it's not, and it can be considered an affectionate correction, which is completely different. It's like opposite land. 
in some ways. So keeping those things in mind and being respectful of that community and the lifestyle and all of the rules. So, but the non-consensual rule is, is hard and fast for me. That's, that's the one I don't cross. Definitely that one too. (laughs) Fiona Z. Um, yeah, I th- definitely non-consent. And then I was thinking maybe um, bestiality would be something I would definitely not not do with my characters or necrophilia. Um, my uh, when I was writing House of Agnes, um, I had a moment where potentially Agnes would kill for Lola, but then I that you know pulled back, and so. That's actually she would actually she would cross that line. So that's not a non-crossable thing. So they're not very many. I mean, depending on the, the story, fantasy, um, murder wives, whatever, the lines move. But yeah, bestiality, necrophilia, and non-consent. Okay, yeah. well, those are, I agree that's a very you. good list. <laughs> I also personally don't think you should kill the other main character because you know, story over. <laughs> Just keep going back Maybe to they Melissa. Maybe they together. You never know. Oh, good point. <laughs> Way together to find forever. forever. Exactly. Whether you want it or not, consensually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go hunting. <laughs> All right, Fiona, I'm sure you have stuff to say. <laughs> I mean, what, you know, the, so the, I would say the one thing that, like Rachel said, like nothing that's, you know, isn't forgivable. I, I jokingly, I have, Trina's much smaller. She's a very petite Asian woman and Kendall's very tall. Um, and, you know, a, after the name calling, Trina sort of j- lunges in her general direction, but clearly it's like one of those, like, mouse and cat situations like you're not getting anywhere here my friends stop me i mean i'm i'm certainly not somebody who's okay with assault so you know i would never let that happen um and there is a point where they both have the opportunity to truly screw the other one over and it's at that point they're in the game and although they're competing it's not about ruining someone's career so much as it's about being successful and beating them so it's definitely not about you know a long-term problem or long-term detriment to something it's surely antagonistic and playful at the point it needs to be playful for it to get to that enemies to lovers part right you have to get to that point where like you respect them enough not to intentionally harm them and that's mm-hmm. kind of where we are so that's that's those are my lines but the rest of them are all great lines i mean I'm on board with the <laughs> no homicide <laughs> and, you know, all you know. consent and no <laughs> no animals harmed <laughs> like, unnecessary homicide now <laughs> oh yeah that's true I was like, don't be mean to their cat. <laughs> yeah, like, don't be And y'all are like, necrophilia. <laughs> we have our okay. different lines, okay? Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about um, how you get balance between the enemy part and the love part. So, cause I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a delicate balance. You know, you've, you've got these characters, you got the audience, your audience invested in, in each one of them for whatever reason, but then, you know, you, you want to have them fall in love, but you also want to keep that tension as long as you can to get that payoff. Um, so and make that payoff as, as, uh, as high as possible. So how, how do you do that? How do you find that balance? Does anyone want to volunteer to go first? Because I've always, you know, I'm happy to volunteer you, Brenda. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm obviously deep in thought. I'm like, God, how do I do that? Um, no one's looking at me. You're all like, right. like <laughs> yeah, look around. I think that, you know, for me, it's not necessarily about them physically connecting because that often happens. That does happen in the beginning part of the book. For me, it's that emotional connection when they finally get to the point to where it's not just a physical thing that they're doing it's not just physical attraction but they have fallen totally down the rabbit hole and realize this is my person and and balancing that and and i i kind of always kind of think of it as a as like stair steps you know like you're you're building on the intimacy that's gone before because I write erotic romance to me, that's, that's how you build that tension. Like, you know, it's not just about the physical connections. It's about where we're going, how much I trust you 
with what's really inside me versus what's on the outside of me. You know, how much do I let that mask that I show the entire world slip so that you see the real me underneath of it? So I try and balance that as I, you know, progress through the book. And, and again, like I said, I, I, if I were a plotter, I'd probably have a real plan, but it's more just an organic way that it grows. And when I get finished and because it's usually as rough as a cob, when I finish a draft, because I haven't done any of those things, when I go back, I kind of shuffle the scenes until it feels right to me. Whereas if I were just reading it on my own, I would say, okay, this next level of intimacy makes sense here. You know, now you've seen me, I don't know, ugly cry or, you know, see me in without my crown off, you know, I'm the queen, but I'm not the queen in this moment um, kind of thing. So I think that, that, that that's where I go with that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, just side question, are all of you non-plotters or plotters or where do you fit on the scale? Raise your hand if you're a plotter. I'm not like a meticulous <laughs> plotter. I'm not one of these people that has like every scene lined out ahead of time. I have a general idea and like a whole bunch of bullet points and I know all the main plot points. That's a lot of plotting, Rachel. <laughs> oh yeah, so okay. I, I raised my hand, didn't I? <laughs> right. I, I mean, I have a scene list. And then you tried to back off a little. Yeah. You're like, I'm not. Uh, I do not have a scene list. I just have a bunch of bullet points of things that are going to happen in the book. All That's right. All. So, but you said, yeah, no, I have a scene <laughs> list, and then people go from like we start out. It's almost like I just put, you know, my little characters into the scene, and then whatever happens happens. So that's okay. That's as much as I have. You still a plot. Okay, no. <laughs> you know, you raised said I was a panty liner. I was a real outliner. <laughs> and I wasn't a pantser. Fiona Z raised like two little fingers there. <laughs> and the reason those fingers came up is because <laughs> I don't like to plot at all. But I realize if I want to keep on schedule, that I have to have something that looks plot-ish. So I like that. I have that glue stick figure thingies. And then if they just end up completely swept away in the story or by the story itself, then that's fine. But if I say, okay, I have to write this book in three months, or I have to write something in, you know, this short amount of time, having a plot or having some sort of structure helps me, but I have the most fun when I have no plot at all. I just have an idea, an image of something, a, a line of dialogue, and I just go with it. And that's, that's the best part of writing for me. I discover it. We discover each other, me and the characters. I love that. I love that. Fiona? Yeah, no, I'm a real plotter. Like I'm, yeah. I'm like a legit <laughs> plotter. Um, you know, I, uh, I have three little kids under five. So for me, I have to write in between not parenting or working uh, my full-time job. So I also never hit a writer's block that way. So when I map out my proposal and submit that to my publisher, I write out the full proposal. It's usually six or seven pages. It's pretty much, uh, I don't go like chapter by chapter, like chapter one, blah, blah, blah. But I do put all the major milestones they're going to hit, their major fight points, first kiss, things like that. So that if I ever get off track writing, because, you know, writing can take you all over the place, I know where to get back to, to hit the things I need to get to make the end to make sense. So I do know the beginning and the end. Um, I do write in order, and unlike Carson, who's insane, um, because it's easier for me to keep going that way. So I do, I plot and I write in order. And, um, but I'm able to write quickly. So, you know, um, the first series I did, I was a, I was the third book in the series called Strike a Match. I wrote Strike a Match in six weeks because I was able to go right down the line. I knew exactly what I was writing and I was able to crank out 10,000 plus words a week because I knew where I was going. And in my life situation, that's very helpful because then I don't end up getting distracted because like Fiona said, we have deadlines, we have timelines, we have things we want to get done. And the only way to get those things done is to be for me to be a little more orderly because life is chaos. So... So where do you keep these notes in your house? You know, I, um, <laughs> I write them in a Word document. My handwriting's horrific. Um, so post-its I, around, I don't use. I write them. Up. So they're I in your computer. They're available if you want to crack through That's right pretty now. much what I'm going for here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a file. <laughs> I'm, I'm hiring a hacker on Fiverr right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love Fiverr. <laughs> I'm hiring someone on Fiverr to write my next book. No, um, so 
just kidding. So, so how does that factor into your um, achieving balance part? Do you have all that written into the, your big bunch of crazy notes, crazy yeah, notes? You know, so for me, the interesting thing about this particular book is I, I knew that I knew who they were. I knew both characters really well because I was writing them, but I actually, I did write a scene out of order for this book and then I had to go backwards. And the way I made that work is I actually gave them um, a non-contentious social meeting right before their romantic relationship started. And one of them was celebrating a major sale and the other one wasn't downing them. And they had a conversation, they had coffee together and it was sort of in passing and, you know, one of them was feeling really flirtatious and happy. She'd made a major sale that put her way ahead in this bet. And the other one, you know, is, is attracted to her and, and enjoys the cat and mouse game that they're playing. So, you know, she shares a cake pop with her and they sit down and have a cup of coffee. And for me, that was the way for me to blend where things are about to change. You can see emotionally, they're changing physically, they're changing socially, they're changing. And that's for me, that was the line that they had to cross together to make the relationship go less enemies, more lovers. They had to get that space. But I had, I did go out of order for that because I felt like it was missing. I felt like we needed to have a little bit of a casual connection to make it less competitive to draw that romance to the front page. I needed a bridge moment. And that was my bridge moment. Well, that sounds like a great bridge moment, but you kind of lost me at sharing a cake pop because those are tiny little <laughs> no, things. They come as two. She gave one cake pop to her. Share a cake pop. Who does that? <laughs> so I have a question for Carlene, who's lurking in the background. Is this a 50 minute panel or an hour panel? <laughs> Can we talk about homicide more, Carlene? Or was it? <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, Carlene. <laughs> we're just getting started. So <laughs> yeah, I say go an hour. It's really not my decision, but go for an hour. What the hell? Okay. Are you, you guys okay with that? So yeah. okay. <laughs> um so Fiona Z, I want to go back to this question because I got off track on the whole plotter thing, but but I think that's informative. Um, so if you kind of outline because you have to, to stay on track, which I can relate to that. Um, how does that affect things? Do you still just find your balance part in the, in the writing or do you plan that out in advance? There is no balance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the stuff is just like, my life is chaos, which is fine. And everything is like throw against the wall and see what sticks. Um, and when I do outlines, even I'm like, okay, if this doesn't actually flow to outline along the outline, it's completely fine. Um, and usually my, my characters have a much better, like have better dialogue, have better lines than I do anyway, and have a better idea of what they want to do. So, um, the outline keeps me on track, helps me actually to meet my deadlines mostly. Um, but I'm okay with them wandering away because I can, when I have that vague outline, it can bring me back to the point where, okay, I have one more month to finish this book. And so they need to do, they need to get to this point by then. And so it does help me. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Rachel, finding the balance. How do you do, do you, do you plan all that out in advance or does that just kind of come to you organically as you're writing? Um, for me, it's about 50, 50. I definitely plan some of it in advance, but I try not to be too married to too much, too many details. Cause sometimes it just veers while I'm writing. And I'm also not one of these authors that, um, plans out like extensive background details about my characters ahead of time. Like, you know, what, what was their favorite book and their favorite you know, ice cream flavor, that kind of thing. I don't do that. But a lot of that comes to me organically while I'm writing. So then that would definitely help me build the, the balance there. Well, that kind of dovetails into our next audience question, which is, do any of you make out character charts, ergo character <laughs> traits, before you start? And it may, maybe you may not know their favorite ice cream, but do you make some kind of character chart? We'll stay with you, Rachel, for this and then move on. Um, I need to know their goal, their, their goal for the book and what's motivating that goal and what the main conflict is going to be to them achieving their goal. And I need to know like their basic personality type, you know, are they, you know, assertive or are they, you know, shy? I need to know like all those basic things about them. And I need to 
plan those with the two characters so that they balance nicely. We can't have two characters that are too much the same. They need to be, you know, two people that are going to really play off each other well. So I, I, I know those more broad things and I try to know a little bit about their like, you know, family and stuff like that. But even sometimes that changes while I'm writing. It just doesn't feel right once I get in there and I'm like, you know, actually I think, you know, <laughs> so yeah. The beauty of fiction. Yeah. This is their goal. This is their goal. <laughs> it's, all, it's all very flexible once I get going. Like who, who knows? <laughs> Brenda? I do, I, I do what Rachel does. I, I have a, um, a spreadsheet that's like goal, motivation, conflict. But my other column is what would they do to get it? What will they do to, to get, get what? To get their goal, to meet their goals, right? To get, to get it, to get it. You know, what will they do? What will they sacrifice to get what they want? Um, which is always the other person, right? I mean, if we're writing romance, we know the ending. They're going to be happy together. It's getting there. And I think that, you know, it's like a murder mystery. You have to figure out who's going to, you know, how do they get to solve the crime? And this is like, how are they going to get together? But I need to know what's their point. What's their tipping point to where they're willing to give something up to get what they want. And, um, and I feel like that's important. And I usually pick, um, uh, I usually have, I'm a very visual person. So I need an image, you know, I'll, I'll find something, some uh, celebrity or somebody online that represents that person to me so that I can put it in my Scrivener. And, and when I go to describe them, I, I have that image, but really knowing I do that. And I do a timeline, like of just a real short, what happened to them in their life. So I know how old they are. So then I can know common, um, because I write contemporary, I want to know things that they've lived through that may impact them as a, as a person and, and their personality and what they do. So, but I don't do that long, you know, 40, I don't have time for 80 questions on my characters. I got to get writing, you know, <laughs> you can make that up later. <laughs> I can figure it out later. Right. Exactly. Fiona Riley. Uh, you know, when I turn in my massive proposal in there, there's personality traits and then there's like um, descriptions, like how old they are, how tall they are, what color hair they have, eyes, whatever. And then just really personality traits. Are they antagonistic? Are they, you know, are they shy? Are they outgoing? I think having that basic stuff on there and then being true to that is easy to write the story because if they have these character traits or flaws, are they, do they, do they not like authority? Are they somebody who had a run in with the law? Like those kind of things are, they're there and it doesn't, need to have a necessary huge backstory somewhere else because the best part of that is bringing that into the story and not having a big information dump right so that's conversational that's relational it's going backwards i don't want you to start the book and be like she was arrested when she was 15 for spray painting a wall and like you don't need to know that you need to know why she doesn't like the police or why she doesn't like to be out late at night or whatever the reason um and that stuff is written in that proposal for me so that's how i organize them that's how i know like you know she bucks authority or whatever um i, I think that's the easiest way to do it if i had the time like brenda said it, no, nobody has the time but to write those kind of things and be that involved i don't think i do well a good enough job of making it conversational in the story because then it's so formatted in my head that i'm just fact spewing and then i don't know how that would translate i want it to come up organically and because it should feel organic well that makes the story flow doesn't it you know when you're not telling everybody something you're showing them you know they get to see by the actions fiona z do you have anything to um, add to this lively yeah, discussion? Very, very little, but um, for, for my characters, I basically have, I just throw random facts down on my note sheet. They're, they're Virgo. They like um, sandwiches with mayonnaise and pickles. And, <laughs> and those things end up forming their actual characters. And so... <laughs> You know, they're they're boring. They're exciting. They're they're meticulous. They they like sex. They don't like sex. They you know they're private. And so these random, seemingly random things help me. Psych, uh, how do you say? Subconsciously, there we go. Subconsciously, like what's that word? <laughs> to actually create or have them create themselves as I write. So it's. I actually downloaded one of those long character sheets before, and then I gave up after I think the fifth thing because it was just <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah, that's just too well, much work. And sometimes <laughs> things occur to you while you're writing, you know, that like it's just ideas pop in while while you're writing. The idea of the the writing itself can spur the the ideas, don't you think? 
Yeah, I, definitely. I don't know. Def Maybe it's just me. Um. <laughs> post-its everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Well, we, um, they have been very nice to extend our time. If there was an extension of time, <laughs> but we're reaching the end and I want to give everybody it. an opportunity to plug your, your latest work or all your work or whatever. You have 60 seconds and <laughs> do, a, do a dance or a story. And now I'm eating into your time, but Rachel, we'll start with you. Okay, um, my most recent release is an Enemies to Lovers book. It is called um, Read Between the Lines. It is sort of a sapphic you've got mail where my two heroines are um, flirting online friends and enemies in real life. One of them is an author, the other one's a bookstore owner, and they flirt with each other online as author and reader, but they don't know that my author character <laughs> in her day job she works for a property development company that has terminated the bookstore's lease. No. So. <laughs> That's rough. That's a yeah. rough one. <laughs> but I, I just, I've always loved that, that dual dynamic of, of their flirting online. And so we can see that connection and how much they like, you know, that they have that chemistry together, but in real life, they're just, you know, at each other's throats. So that's awesome. Enemy, yeah. secret enemies, <laughs> secret enemies. <laughs> Brenda. Well, I'm just going to plug double six. Um, <laughs> um, I have, I have more stuff that's out right now, but none of it's enemies to lover. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, um, it's probably I, I, not a legacy is the other one that I have that um, is also enemies to lovers. And that's, um, that's where it, again, it's set in uh, on the Isle of Sky at Rowan house, at BDSM brothel. Um, so yeah, so check it out. That's your gig. <laughs> Check it out if it's not your gig. It might become right. your gig. Uh, exactly. Fiona Z. Um, my Enemies to Lovers book is House of Agnes. And House of Agnes is um, a novel about a woman. She's a madam. And there's a reporter who thinks that the madam killed her sister. And so that's enemies right off the bat. And then they solve the mystery together while hating each other and having hate sex. Bye hate now. sex. I mean... Oh. Hate sex. Not, hate sex. Hate <laughs> sex. That is awesome. <laughs> Fiona Riley, tell us a story. Um, so the, the book we were talking about tonight um, is Bet Against Me, which is the start of the High Stakes Romance series. My most recent book is the last book in the series, which is Beginner's Bet. Um, and it does, it follows a really high, um, high stakes real estate firm in Boston called Gamble and Associates, which is why the bet term is in all the titles. Um, feel free to check it out. It's fun world building. Uh, I'm Team Trina, and I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Well, I'm team all of you because you are amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to our audience for great questions. Y'all take you, care. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.